today for getting out in the rain. Um, if you have your cell phone on, if you would silence it, please. Um, I probably shouldn't have scheduled this right in the middle of the perfect storm of pollen, so <laughs> uh, bear with me if I have to get a drink of water. Um, I'm Linda Severson, and I'm thrilled to be here with you today. I plan to tell you about my memoir, Wildflowers and Broken Gods, and how you can blend the healthy Mediterranean diet and lifestyle into your own life. Are y'all hearing me okay in the background? Yes. 45 years ago, the shrill ring of a black rotary dial telephone woke me in the middle of the night. I sprinted through the house in the dark and to answer the phone. It was my husband calling from Athens. Athens, Greece, not Athens, Texas. <laughs> He'd been waiting in the phone company there for several hours for the call to go through. We'd only, we hadn't spoken in three months and we'd only been able to exchange uh, letters which took three weeks to be delivered, so there was a whole lot to talk about. I'd been waiting and waiting for him to call. I was elated to speak to him, but he sounded very far away and the connection was kind of bad. He told me that he loved me and our two small children and that he had found us a house to rent for one year in Cato, Ohio, Greece. And this is one of the hand-drawn maps from our um, from my book. I'll uh, follow the pointer here from Athens through the city of Corinth, through Patras, and here is our little village where we were headed, Cato, Ohio, Greece. Cato, Ohio was a remote little dirt road village at the northern tip of the Peloponnese. That whole section is actually a peninsula and it's joined by four miles of earth at the city of Corinth. It's almost like an island. The call was short and to the point. We hung up and I immediately began packing the one large suitcase we would be allowed to take on our trip. I also packed a large diaper bag with bottles of powdered milk, baby food, and disposable diapers for our infant daughter, Tamara. I had purchased a child-sized harness and leash for our one-and-a-half-year-old son, Matt, who was also still in diapers. The harness and leash brought stares from other travelers, but I couldn't bear the thought of leaving, losing him in, in busy John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York City. So the next morning, we drove two and a half hours to Will Rogers World Airport in Oklahoma City to begin our journey to the other side of the world. So our great adventure began a year which would change us and the way we live forever. And that's what I want to share with you today. Al and I, and this by the way is my husband Al and this is my son Matt. <laughs> um, Al and I were typical young Americans whose lives revolved around the television and the refrigerator. The wise ancient Greek philosopher Socrates said, the only true wisdom is in knowing you know nothing. Well, I was very naive heading off with my two small children like that. But I was also very stubborn. I didn't want our family to be separated for a whole year because I'd seen a lot of other Air Force families break up under those same conditions. So the year was 1971. The Vietnam War was dragging on and as probably most of you remember, it was the first war that was fought every evening in our living rooms on the nightly news. Al and I had been fortunate to stay stateside for the first three years of his four-year Air Force commitment. We were real glad when he got orders for what the Air Force termed a remote, isolated detachment called Araxis, Greece. And on this little map, you see it's right here next to Cato, Ohio. Here's a close-up map of that section of the Peloponnese. He could have been sent to the border of Laos and Vietnam. He narrowly escaped getting that assignment, and if that was a radio hill where no airman had returned alive. So we were real happy about Araxis. About 90 U.S. airmen are stationed at Araxis in support of the Hellenic Air Force, which is right next door, because they were part of NATO and they had nuclear weapons. <coughs> Al's job as a radio man was to receive an all-clear signal and to relay that signal on once every hour. 
Only nine or ten of the airmen took their families. We'd always heard it said, if the Air Force wanted you to have a wife, they would have issued you one. <laughs> the Air Force wasn't happy, but they couldn't keep me and the kids from going. They did, however, insist that I buy round-trip airfare because they didn't want us stuck there if some catastrophe broke out. Mine was full fare, Matt's was half fare, and Tammy's was free based on the assumption she would ride in my lap the whole way. Well, that didn't happen. <laughs> Our flight to Greece was an adventure in itself. In 1971, credit cards were new and I didn't have one, so it was cash or traveler's checks. Those were my only options. I scrimped and saved to get the money for the tickets. When we got to the airport, I went to the counter to buy the tickets and they told me it was gonna be $157 more than what they quoted me on the phone a couple days before. Well, in 1971, that was a lot of money. <laughs> And luckily, my mom and dad had come along to take our car back to their house. And I don't know whether it was father's intuition or what, but my dad had cash. He loaned me the money, and I bought the tickets. That was the first inkling of trouble on our trip. So off the three of us set off into the wild blue yonder with our shot record, our passport, and our diaper bag. About an hour out of New York City, a turbulent thunderstorm popped up. We were bucking across the sky like a bronc. The pilot was ordered to stack up the Circle Airport along with all the other flights that come into LaGuardia. It's a very busy airport. Finally, they let us land. The Red Cross had arranged for a driver to drive us across New York City from LaGuardia to John F. Kennedy International because there was very little time to make our connection flight under good conditions. And here with this storm, who knows? And it was still raining pretty hard. Back in 71, as you remember, there were no jetways. We deplaned by means of the rolling stairs that were pushed up to the side of the plane. We had to walk across the tarmac. By the time we got inside the terminal, we were drenched. There was only one flight out of New York City to Athens each day. So if we missed our connection flight, we would be stuck in the airport overnight. I didn't even want to think about that. I just put that out of my mind. My Red Cross knight in shining armor got us across town to JFK just as quick as humanly possible. We made our way into the space age looking terminal, Matt walking beside me on his leash, me carrying Tammy, our big suitcase, the diaper bag, and my purse. My scrawny arms were stronger than they looked from months of toddler lifting, and I know all the moms in the audience know exactly what I'm talking about. As we made our way through the crowded airport, my eyes searched for the Trans World Airline desk. And I kept saying to myself, you can do this, you can do this. We arrived at the desk, checked our large suitcase, and were rushed to the gate on a tram. As soon as we got settled into our seats, a voice came over the loudspeaker and said, the flight to Athens has been delayed due to the storm. So we sat for a couple more hours on the tarmac watching the rain go down the windows of the plane. Then we were finally allowed to take off. Our first stop in uh, Europe was Portugal. There all the English speaking pilots and crew members got off the plane and were replaced by non-English speakers. So from then on, when I needed water for Tammy's bottles or anything else for my children, I had to act out these awkward charades to try to convey what I needed, and they seemed to get a kick out of that. Next, we landed briefly in Madrid, Spain. Our next stop should have been Athens, but instead we were forced to make an unscheduled stop in Rome, Italy. There, two Italian men boarded the plane, came directly to my seat, and started speaking to me in Italian and pulling on my arm. Well, I had no idea what to think. I tried to show them our passport. We were all three on the same passport. The picture had been taken on an extremely hot day in Western Oklahoma. I was holding both the kids. Matt was shirtless and sucking his thumb. Tammy was looking very disgruntled. It was a pretty funny picture, but they paid no attention at all. We were forced to leave our seats descend the rolling stairway, cross the tarmac, and then with the two men, we waited inside the terminal, looking out through a big window toward the plane. I was, my mind was racing wildly, trying to think how I was gonna to explain to Al that we had been kicked off the plane one country before Greece. 
A gentleman who spoke a little bit of English tried to help. He tried to explain. He made crawling motions with his hands and flying motions. And then I finally, in his conversation, caught the word bugs. And then I understood uh, some sort of insect called the medfly, which you may remember being in the news years ago. Uh, it was attacking the citrus fruit trees of the region. And you couldn't even fly over Italy without stopping to get fumigated. <laughs> So while we waited inside the terminal, more uniformed men sprayed insecticide inside the plane, around the passengers, and in the undercarriage using these old-fashioned pump sprayers. The other passengers showed no ill effects when we were allowed to return to our seats, and they seemed to be happy that we'd been allowed back on board. In the air once more, I was ready for this expedition to end. I felt like I had been on a three-day slumber party. I was surviving on a couple of cat naps and very little to eat since we left Oklahoma. After a short while, we landed in Athens. We had been traveling almost 24 hours, and my little globe trotters had logged more air miles than most people do in their lifetime. I just felt like kissing the ground. <laughs> Our carefully packed suitcase did not arrive with us, but it did come the next day on the next flight from New York. You know, you don't joke with customs inspectors. They're not known for smiling about anything, but they found our passport picture amusing. <laughs> they stamped our passport, rifled through our diaper bag, and let us go into the Athens International Airport Terminal. There we saw dozens of uniformed soldiers carrying guns, something that was happening right this week in, in Belgium, but it was happening all the way back in 71 in Athens. Their eyes visually frisk everyone that passed by, including us. You know, most Americans were untouched by acts of terrorism prior to 9-11, but Athens had been victim of lots of violent incidents going way back into the 60s, and skyjacking was the favorite means of the terrorists to gain control of a plane load of innocent people to be held hostage. That threat hadn't crossed my mind, but when I saw the soldiers, of course, with guns, I'd never seen anything like that in my life, and I was alarmed. We stood at the, high, the side of the high ceiling room, my eyes searching frantically for Al. After about half an hour, my darling husband appeared. <laughs> he embraced all three of us and twirled us around, and I thought to myself, everything will be all right now. Whatever lay ahead, we could handle it together. Al said he'd been expecting us the previous day. He waited several hours at the airport and couldn't find out anything about why we were delayed. I'm sure skyjacking probably crossed his mind. By chance, he returned at the correct time as we waited. Now you know why I believe in guardian angels. <laughs> They've saved me so many times. We traveled by taxi to our hotel, enjoyed a peaceful night, and then did some drive-by sightseeing the next morning. Then we returned to the airport to get our overdue luggage. Al had ridden to Athens with an airman who had a vehicle, one of few Americans that had one of their own. The custom was that when an airman got ready to depart after his tour of duty was over, he would wheel his vehicle to a newly arrived airman. And the same procedure was used for household goods. No money changed hands in these transactions. So Al had furnished our home primarily by this method. He hoped to receive his international driver's license and get a car for us soon. The money exchange rate was favorable for Americans. It stayed a stable 30 drachmas to one American dollar the whole year we were there. So we could live pretty well on airmen's pay. For the trip to our new home, Al arranged for a taxi to drive us all the way from Athens to Cato, Ohio, a distance of 242 kilometers. Uh, Greece, like most of the world, is on the metric system. That's equivalent to about 150 American miles. It would be much faster and more comfortable than riding on a train or crowded bus, because the trains and buses tended to stop at every single village, so it took a long time to get anywhere. The taxi cab ride would be the last bit of luxury we would have for quite a while. The prearranged ta taxi, driven by a nervous-looking, wiry little man wearing cornroom glasses, picked us up at the hotel in the late afternoon. 
It, the cab was a nice mid-sized car, so Al and I sat in the back with the kids between us. We left Athens and accelerated out through the suburbs past the port of Piraeus toward the city of Corinth. Yes, this is the Corinth that you've read about in the Bible, in the letters to the Corinthians, where you can walk in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul. This immediately makes you realize what an ancient country Greece is compared to America. Our cabbie drove fast on the open road, but then when he came to a village, he slowed to a crawl to avoid pedestrians and sheep herds, a long, shaggy-haired sheep that would be rock crossing the road. The highway looked a lot like Highway 1, the Pacific Coast Highway that goes up the coast of California. Um, if you've never driven on it, I'm sure you've seen it in dozens of <coughs> movies and TV shows. It's that road that's just right on the edge of a sheer cliff that goes down to the sea. They're always running cars off of the edge for dramatic effect. In this case, the sea was the Gulf of Corinth, and it was every shade of blue from aqua to cobalt. So beautiful. The highway was a simple asphalt road with no stripes on it. We began to notice our cab driver playing chicken with oncoming buses to see who was gonna monopolize the center of the road. And then after it got dark, he began turning off his headlights if there were any street lights present. Al and I exchanged terrified looks, but we kept silent. It was dark when we finally reached our new hometown, Katoa Haya but I could see that it was surrounded by groves of orange trees and I could see the sea down below. Cato is a rustic little village of about 500 people with a few more living on farms in the outlying area. It, the town has few paved streets, but the stucco houses look neat and tidy and well cared for. Al directed the cabbie to the center square of the town and then we drove one block to our new house it stood at the intersection of two rough dirt roads. By the glow of the streetlight, I could see it was one of the nicest and newest homes in town. It was one story white stucco with blue shutters. For this, we would pay 43 American dollars a month, and that would include water and electricity. The driver left us there, and we were eager to explore our new home. Al opened the metal filigree front door that had frosted glass window panes in it, and we entered. He said we were the first family to live there. Excuse me. We found generously sized rooms with white marble floors and high ceilings. We made our way into the kitchen and I saw a sink with running water and a small counter. Looking around, I said, um, where are you hiding the refrigerator? <coughs> and he said, we don't have one yet, but I'm working on it. It looks like we're gonna have to get it from the next town. Well, my mind instantly started racing, trying to think how I was gonna feed my family, especially with two small children and no fridge, that central feature of American life. I would have to shop for fresh food daily, but that would be good for us. Near the sink was a three burner hot plate hooked up to a propane pain tank. There was no oven. A table, four chairs, and a freestanding cabinet stood on one side of the room, and there was a high chair for Tammy. He had thought about everything. <laughs> A plastic five-gallon container stood on the floor near the sink. Al saw me eyeing the jug, and he said, the Americans haven't been able to drink the water without getting sick, but it's okay to wash with it. We have to get the drinking water out at Araxis. Down the hall was a large bedroom, bare except for a metal frame bed that looked kind of like what we would call a rollaway, and it had a handmade mattress on it. There was no closet. A second bedroom was set up with a crib for Matt, and, I mean, a crib for Tammy and a single bed for Matt. Both had the hand-sewn mattresses also. Al said, the best news is we have an indoor bathroom, which is rare in Cato. Well, I looked heavenward and said, thank you, Lord, because the possibility of an outhouse hadn't even entered my consciousness. I would not take anything for granted from that day forward. The next morning, in the light of day, I looked out the back door and saw plain, square, white stucco houses with flat roofs like ours. Most of the doors, shutters, and trim were painted either Greek flag blue or wasabi green. Red geraniums grew abundantly in old olive oil cans, and the vivid blue of the sky above just intensified all these pure colors. 
In the surrounding yards, I saw the housewives of Cato shaking out colorful flocati rugs made from those long-haired shaggy sheep, washing clothes in tubs, and tending chickens, goats, rabbits, and sheep. Before long, I was out in the backyard washing clothes and diapers in the tub. Lots and lots of diapers. <laughs> Al rigged us up a clothesline. Um, I could only get disposable diapers, which were new on the market once in a while in Athens, so I had to buy some cotton flannel and make my own diapers. <coughs> American fa families were just a little community within the bigger community. We were all close friends, and we depended on each other to help each other and support each other. We traded babysitting, uh, food, um, household goods, meager as they were. When anyone was traveling to Athens to the Air Force Comedy Commissary, he would take a list of the needs of the other families. Um, it was interesting to see what everyone's priorities were, the thing that they could <coughs> live without. Mine, of course, was always disposable diapers. <laughs> When they retired from Athens and went from house to house delivering the items, it was just like Christmas morning for us. We had a garden in our backyard, which our landlord's mother tended, and it all looked like weeds to me, but she showed me that they were herbs and a mustard green type plant, which um, was a large part of their diet. It looked kind of like kale that we see in the store today. And I saw what looked like giant pearls hanging from some of the eaves of the houses. And I learned that those were balls of fresh feta cheese being hung up with cheesecloth slings being drained of the whey that forms when you make cheese. Uh, we, after just a few hours of draining, it's ready to eat. It didn't take long at all. We bought softball-sized feta cheeses, and they were in little handmade baskets at the farmer's market around the square on Saturday. Young Americans, we ate American and cheddar cheese, and I never thought about where that cheese came from, and I certainly wouldn't have thought that I could make my own cheese, but seeing sheep and goats being milked in the next yard put us directly in touch with the source of our food, and it really opened our eyes. Cheddar and other aged cheeses are swapped with a preservative saltwater solution for months, and that's why they develop that rind and they're much saltier than fresh cheeses like feta or goat cheese. Quickly made cheese is much healthier, especially if you have blood pressure problems. Aged cheeses weren't found at all in Cato. However, they are very popular in lots of other European countries. The most striking traits that I saw in the Greek people that I knew were frugality, their uncomplicated simplicity of the way they lived and their unrestrained hospitality to foreigners like us. They waste absolutely nothing. Uh, grapes are a good example. Almost every family of Cato had a grapevine by their door and that gave shade, gave fruit, raisins. They used the leaves for something called domati, that's uh, rice that's flavored with a little meat, maybe uh, once in a while if that's meat, uh, it's got uh, um, pine nuts or almonds and some seasonings, and they roll it up, poach it. It's served either hot or cold with olive oil drizzled over it. The grape harvest was going on when we got to Cato, and we noticed this large wooden press, big thing with a big wooden plate that could be cranked down, and it was on a wagon with wagon wheels like this tall, wooden wagon wheels and it was just being pulled manually from one house to the next by the citizens of Cato. We realized they were replenishing their wine barrels. The unwashed grapes, stems, and leaves are all pressed, and then our neighbors would use their family recipe for just the precise amount of sugar to feed the yeast to make a delightful homemade wine. The stuff left in the bottom of the press, the pulp of peel, seeds, and leaves stems is called the must and it's not thrown away it's a valuable commodity it is distilled in a copper boiler with coiled copper tubing just like what the moonshiners use uh, each family puts in their own secret ingredients to flavor it and it makes a clear spirit and it's called sapuro it keeps many a Greek warm on a cold winter night <laughs> The um, popular aperitif ouzo, which you may have heard of, uh, 
very popular Greek drink. Uh, it has Sapporo as its origin. And I'll tell you more about Uzo a little later. Last of all, the must is spread on the garden for fertilizer. They cost <coughs> nothing. Grandmotherly Greek women dressed in black from head to toe often walked down the road by our house. Um, they even had strips of wool wrapped around their legs. The only parts showing were their, from their eyes to their chin and their hands. And those parts told the story of many years of hard work outdoors in olive groves, carrying water and tending animals. Their costume never varied even when the weather got pretty hot. They did a lot of purposeful walking, not just for exercise. In the morning, we'd see them walking along our road with big pans of food, and they were going to the bakery. They would pay the baker a few drachmas to bake the food. So in the evening, they'd come by our house again with the fragrant food they were taking home to their family, cheerfully chattering along the way. They didn't have ovens either. Researchers have discovered that older people who walk regularly on rough terrain or cobblestones have a resistance to falling that the rest of us don't have. So if you walk for exercise, it's good to get off the smooth path occasionally. I've done this myself right here in Riverside Park. Few citizens of Cato had cars. Burrows were used for carrying heavy burdens. I called them the pickup trucks of Cato. <laughs> They were used for transportation for thousands of years in Greece long before any roads existed, and they're suited perfectly to the terrain. Buses were the most popular mode of transportation. They ran hourly from the bus station that was just around the corner from our house. It wasn't unusual to see people carrying chickens or goats on the bus, and some people carried uh, large Demijohn bottles of wine that they had purchased uh, at the Ohio Kloss Winery, which was about 17 miles away. Only a few of the most fortunate children of Cato went to school, and it only went up to the sixth grade. Most of the boys learned the occupation of their fathers and their uncles. In Greece, in 1971, a young man could still aspire to be a shepherd. Most of the girls stayed home helping their mothers, and the young people usually lived at home until they married. They didn't seem to have all the choices that we had as young Americans about what to do with their life, but they seemed content, and in fact, um, all the people of all ages seemed to know, they seemed to know their purpose in life and what they were destined to do and be content with that. Researchers find that people <coughs> are easily overwhelmed when they have too many options. Uh, they often choose poorly, feel bad about it later, or they're, they're unable to choose at all. And I know a lot of people that read so many reviews online before they make a purchase, they get totally befuddled and then they, you know, it takes all the fun out of the shopping. Once I visited our landlord in his home, I was shocked to see that their family of five, including the grandmother, all slept in one tiny bedroom with about this much space to walk around the bed. They were living like gherkins in a jar while we had all this space in our house. So I asked the local cab driver, who was the best English speaker in Cato, to translate for me and ask me why the landlord didn't move his family into the big house. Well, he explained that he had built the house as an investment Year after year, the American families would pay rent. When the house was paid in full, he would move his family in and they would luxuriate in all that space. What a wise and patient man he was. Patience like that is hard to come by anymore. I hope that he achieved his dream and I hope that they're living there now. In 1971, 98% of the Greek people belong to the Greek Orthodox Christian Church, which traces its roots back to the original 12 apostles. And um, in the services, they speak the original Greek language in which the New Testament was written. I attribute the close, happy families of Cato to their faith and their simple, tranquil way of living close to nature. Excuse me, I'm going to get a sip of water. Most Greek children are named after saints, and they celebrate their birthdays <coughs> as usual until they're 12 years of age, and from then on, they celebrate on the day of the saint they're named after. 
So the most popular saint names have huge groups of people celebrating together on the same day. Can you imagine how close we'd all be if we all went to the same church and celebrated our birthdays together? <laughs> Although most Americans would call them deprived, poor, and lacking in material goods, they were some of the happiest people I've ever known. Contentment in Cato was almost palpable. Their way of living spoke loudly to me, though I could only understand a few of their words, and it taught me lessons that changed my way of thinking forever. As you can probably tell by the fact that I followed my husband to the other side of the world, family <laughs> is very important to me. I've always tried to have a sit-down meal together each day, and it wasn't easy when my kids were teenagers. They were busy, and I was working. Um, they were into sports and cheerleading, but I always made the effort, even if the food wasn't homemade. I think my kids and my husband, by that effort, saw that family was important to me, and they made them value family more also. So we got a lot more than nourishment from those meals. We talked about everything around our table. Of course, I wasn't dealing with social media, so <laughs> now I see people in restaurants, everyone's sitting there, but no one's talking to each other. The need to shop for fresh food daily in Cato got me out into the community quickly. We rigged up an old stroller so it would hold both of the kids, and as we walked to the stores, neighbors that we didn't know would rush out of their house and say, Yasu, which means hello, and shake our hands. Uh, the, a love of welcoming visitors seems to dwell in the hearts of the Greek people. No matter how little they have, they always offer their best seat, their best food, their best drink, <coughs> their best. I couldn't speak enough Greek to um, really discuss their beliefs with them, but I saw them in action, a cup of cool water, a bite of bread. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. I don't know if you follow the refugee crisis that um, started on the northern border of Greece around the end of February. It's been detailed a lot in the USA Today newspaper. Of course, I'm intensely interested in Greece, so <laughs> I read every word. And a few of the things really popped out to me. Uh, one headline on March 13th said, In Greece, crisis yields compassion. What's happened is the countries north of the northern mainland of Greece are not allowing the refugees to go farther up into Europe. So um, there was a camp encampment, I mean just a tent city, for, set up for 2,000 people near the village of Idomeni, which is a real small village, only 120 people. They lost their school about 20 years ago for lack of students. So um, now, because of this bottleneck that's formed, there's like 13,000 people there, and they're expecting it to go up to 20,000 people. Well, the, the people of Idomeni are not rich people by any means, but they're out there trying to help. Um, my husband and I were in um, a catastrophe of that magnitude. Uh, we lived three blocks from the beach in um, Gulfport, Mississippi when Hurricane Camille hit. And you don't know helpless until you have no store to where you can go buy anything. You are without water, food, you have nothing. And um, you really remember the people that help you. Well, these people in Idomeni, their tr crops have been trampled by all these people, but they're still out there trying to help. A couple of the quotes really jumped out at me. The first one is, the Greeks have been very nice to us. They bring us food and clothes for our children, said Amat Kurdi. For some, this camp is a respite. After traveling and sleeping outdoors for weeks, Nada Suri, age 17 of Iraq, sits and rests with her mother and older sister. Here we just sleep, eat, sleep, and eat, Nada said playfully, describing her days at the border. That just warms my heart to know that the Greek people haven't lost their giving nature because they've been through a lot of rough years in the last uh, few years. Um, but, you know, kindness like that, it has a ripple effect in the world. <laughs> The storekeepers of Cato seemed honored when we came to their store, and they often offered us ouzo shots, which um, ouzo is a licorice-flavored spirit, which is as popular there as tequila is 
here in Texas, and it's just as strong, by the way. <laughs> I was not a, a drinker, <laughs> but I went ahead and drank it because I didn't want to insult the people. Most of the shops specialize in selling one type of food, like uh, seafood at the fishmongers, the vegetable seller, the fruit stand. Uh, the butcher had full carcasses hung up on hooks in full view of people as you walk down the street. Well, I was used to seeing meat in small packages with plastic over them, but I got used to seeing those carcasses before long. Uh, we had a phrase book and we took it to the butcher and tried to convey that we wanted to buy beef if he ever got any. So uh, three times during the year, he sent young boys running to our house to notify us that he had got some beef. And I'm sure it was probably an old dairy cow, but it tasted just wonderful to us and I know it was grass fed. <laughs> there was one store that sold a variety of items and it reminded me of a general store you see in an old Western movie. There were no shopping carts. What you did was accumulate your items on the counter and then the shopkeeper would mentally tally up what you had and she would write a number on a piece of paper and I would know how many drachmas to pay her. They had fresh eggs laid that morning nestled in tissue paper for sale and they were sold individually, not by the dozen because no one else had a refrigerator either. <laughs> there was a large crock of Kalamata olives, most olives I've ever seen in one place. And you would dip out how much you wanted into a little wax paper cup and put it on the counter. I relied on pasta shells, beans, macaroni, and noodles I could buy there. And then I would mine how much I wanted to cut off of this log of tomato paste that she was selling. This stuff was thick. <laughs> I could buy flour, but no butter, shortening, or milk. We continued to have to buy powdered milk in Athens because everyone else had their milk right in their backyard. <laughs> Honey was the only sweetener used and beautifully decorated tins of olive oil that held three liters were stacked up for sale. About 1990, researchers began realizing that the Mediterranean diet is the healthiest in the world. It varies slightly as you go around the Mediterranean from Spain all the way through the Middle East and down into Africa. But the one constant factor in all these Mediterranean diets is olive oil. Olive oil was the only oil in Cato. Um, you hear jokes that people in Europe bathe in the stuff. <laughs> well, um, I know for a fact in Greece, they do christen their children by anointing their head with olive oil. I was doing a little research and I found uh, about the Texas Olive Oil Council and they said, Victoria, is the most conducive climate to growing olives in Texas. And we do have a grove that was planted, I think in 2012 or 13, out of 59. <coughs> so maybe eventually we'll have a different kind of oil <coughs> around here. <laughs> Large servings of meat were not found. Meat was used more like a condiment there. Small bites flavor the whole dish. Fish, squid, Almonds and lots and lots of vegetables are the mainstays of the diet. Um, the wealthy people might have meat once a week. Uh, the less fortunate people might only have meat on Easter. That is their major holiday. The olive oil was drizzled over all the food, so it was very delicious and you ate more of that food naturally. My favorite was always the Greek salad, and it's not a lettuce type salad. It's just simply uh, tomatoes, onions, and cucumbers layered up a couple of times, drizzled with the olive oil, no other dressing, uh, feta cheese, and Kalamata olives on the side. It's a simple, easy to make, quick salad. It, the vegetables would be in the garden in the morning and on our plates at lunchtime, and to me, nothing is better than a homegrown tomato. For over 40 years, I've been searching for olive oil that tastes as good as what we had in Cato. It was so wonderful. About a year ago, my son Matt found this bottle and brought it to me, and my excitement started to build because it was the right color, the bright chartreuse green. It was opaque with olive oil particles. I tasted it, and as they say in Texas, it was what I was hankering for. <laughs> the label says it's hand-picked crushed within eight hours of leaving the trees. So it's the first olives um, that are picked by hand. All the olives are picked by hand. 
and it, the trees could be hundreds of years old. They have documented uh, at least two trees in the Middle East area are over a thousand years old and they're still bearing fruit. The olive tree is a very interesting plant for those of you that like gardening. I found this bottle a few weeks ago at HEB and you can see how opaque it is. Most people that use canola oil or some other kind of oil would look at that and say, that's rancid. Well, what that is, that's those precious olive oil par olive particles in there. And that's what gives it the wonderful flavor in so many phytochemicals. Um, one second. Okay, I lost my train of thought there. Um, scientists say that eating olive oil each day prevents cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and they've recently found dementia, the big four diseases that we are facing in America. And if you are interested in reading the science behind all that, um, I recommend the book Smart Fat by Stephen Masley, MD. Um, in his bibliography, he lists all the scientific studies, so you can go to the, the um, studies online and read them. Unfortunately, the American diet is causing young people to develop these diseases at a rate never seen before in our history. Um, oh, I remember what I was going to say. Um, this is just a special delight at the first of the olive oil season. Because of all these particles, they can't preserve that. It would start to ferment. So they have to just bottle it immediately and consume it. <laughs> so if you run out, and uh, you're going to have to wait till the next <coughs> olive season that rolls around before you can have more. Unfortunately, the American diet is causing young people to develop these diseases at a rate never seen before in history. Would you like to introduce your family to olive oil that you're afraid they're going to balk at giving up butter and margarine? Well, I have some ways to make small incremental changes. You know, psychologists tell us that making small gradual changes are much more successful than when you go in on New Year's Day and throw out half the stuff in your kitchen and try to start a new <coughs> method. Uh, your family's probably going to balk at that. <laughs> um, when you cook vegetables in broth or water um, at the beginning of the cooking stage, whether it's canned vegetables, frozen, or um, fresh, add a couple of teaspoons of olive oil to your cooking water. And when your vegetables are done cooking, they will be perfectly glazed with the olive oil and they will taste delicious. You won't need to add any margarine or butter. And I've persuaded people that were big time doubters about this, I mean, people that have used margarine their whole life and they were really pleasantly surprised how good it tastes. The only exception is potatoes. It changes the texture of potatoes, so it's still better to just cook your potatoes, drain them, then drizzle the olive oil over. You can use olive oil for frying eggs, for sauteing meat, fish, and vegetables. It's not recommended for deep frying because it breaks down at high temperatures. I always keep two bottles. I keep my best oil for fresh foods that are not cooked, things that you want to drizzle the oil over, like salads or dipping bread. And then I have a or more ordinary bottle for the cooking. Um, my favorite snack is popcorn, and it is so good prepared with olive oil. My son makes it in the traditional method with a pan on the stove, and it's so good. I use air pop and drizzle the olive oil over it. I like it better than melted butter. And my daughter makes it in the microwave. Um, she takes a little brown lunch bag, puts a couple of tablespoons of the loose kernels in there, closes the top, pops it in the microwave, and then she drizzles olive oil over. It's perfect little serving. Another staple of the Mediterranean diet is yogurt. In Cato, it was made with sheep's milk. We also have ice cream made from sheep's milk, and it tastes good. Authentic Greek yogurt is not much like anything you find in your grocery store here. <laughs> it had no sugar, only the lactose, which naturally occurs in milk. Um, of the grocery store brands, I would say the one that's most like Greek yogurt is Faye, that's spelled F-A-G-E, and they have the plain yogurt without any added sugar. Um, the thing about 
they have really gone crazy adding so much sugar, especially to the yogurts that are aimed at young people and children. If you compare them label for label, they have just as much sugar as pudding, which is a dessert. Yogurt is supposed to be a health food. So um, they've kind of gotten off the track there. If you get your own unflavored, unsweetened yogurt, you can control how much sweetener, and you can use a no calorie sweetener or honey or whatever you can control. <coughs> In Kato, plain yogurt was used to top vegetables, fruit, and fish, and uh, as a thickener for soup. It was used as a marinade to tenderize meat. It was thinned with milk as a drink. That's what the shepherds drink. And it was sweetened with honey for dessert. I've been making my own yogurt for years, ever since we came back from Greece. And I had a little Salton yogurt maker that made five cups. But I eat yogurt pretty much every day, so it seemed like I was making yogurt every time I turned around. So I tried to find um, a larger capacity machine, and I didn't find one on the market. So I devised my own method uh, with just things that you find around the house. The key element is the heating pad, just like what you use for your sore back, because you need a low, constant heat. And so if it has a cloth cover on it, you just slide off the cover. You need a, a little lift. This is a thing from, that held a pizza stone, and I flipped it over because you want your baking dish to have a little air space between the heating pad and the uh, dish. Of course, you need to be on a heat-proof counter, but this is just used on medium, so it didn't, doesn't get that warm. Um, you um, need a large pan. Um, what type of milk should you use? Well, you can use a half a gallon of either whole milk